Hey there, it's Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and welcome back for some more MixCon. Today we've got something really different, a amazing Grammy-winning producer, engineer, mixer by the name of Jeff Ellis is going to be giving us not just a mix walkthrough, but a true masterclass that's really about how to listen to the music that you're working on to avoid some of the biggest pitfalls that plague all of us at the mixing stage. Jeff is one of the only presenters in MixCon history to be brought back for a second MixCon masterclass, and this one is totally different than his last one. He's going to give you advice in part one on how to avoid what he calls mixer brain, this issue that plagues all of us, that keeps us from making our best mix decisions. He's also going to show you how to avoid going down the mixer's death spiral, where you're doing more and more and making your mixes sound worse and worse and sucking the soul and life out of them. If you've ever been there, raise your hand, or better yet, hit the like button. I'm going to be smashing it along with you because I know that I've been there. And in the end, he's going to take us for a studio tour and give us a sense for his setup, why it is the way that it is, and what he thinks is most important in your listening and mixing environment. Which brings me to the fact that all of these MixCon videos are free to the public thanks to our sponsors. And the sponsor on this one is a perfect fit. It is Cali Audio. Cali Audio makes some remarkably affordable monitors, and they're actually the monitors that Jeff uses in his studio. In fact, before he installed Cali Audio monitors in his studio, he had other speakers in there that cost multiple times more than his current Cali's. But he likes his Cali's better because he believes that they are much better at leading him in the right direction with his mixes. They don't fool him into thinking that things sound better than they really do. They help force him to focus on the parts of the mix that really matter. And especially in their three-way IN series, they just give you amazingly precise and detailed mid-range, which is what the mixer really needs to understand at the mixing stage. So big thanks to Cali Audio for helping make this one free to the public. Jeff will talk a little bit about why he likes their monitors and a whole lot about his whole philosophy when it comes to mixing and avoiding the biggest mistakes we make in the mix. Stay tuned because after the premiere of this masterclass, we're going to have a live Q&A with Jeff where he will answer your questions. If you're watching the live premiere of this video and any questions pop into your mind, feel free to type them right into the chat box and we will save the best ones for that upcoming Q&A right afterwards. And if you're here around when this video comes out, we are also giving away more than $10,000 worth of gear from all of the MixCon sponsors. You've got three chances to win, so make sure you enter the MixCon mega giveaway. We'll have links for that in the description and the comments down below as well. We're getting near the end of MixCon here, and we're going out with a bang, but there still are some more presentations yet to come. So if you want to RSVP for any of those, make sure you go over to mix-con.com. That's mix-con.com to RSVP to make sure you don't miss any more live premieres or live Q&As. All right, without any more from me, let's get right into it. Mixing Masterclass with Jeff Ellis from MixCon 2023. I'm Jeff Ellis Worldwide. Welcome to my studio. We're at East West Studios in sunny Hollywood, California. This is my wonderful studio audience. This is MixCon 2023. It's been a few years since I've been at MixCon and I'm happy to be back. Today, we're going to be talking about this concept of mixer brain, okay? And mixer brain is a terrible disease that anybody who tries to become a mixer instantly gets. I've suffered from it for years and everybody that you come in contact with in the music industry, it just spreads around and A&Rs get it, managers get it, artists get it really bad. Anybody who is in the realm of making music suffers from Mixer Brain. And the first step to getting rid of Mixer Brain is just acknowledging that you have it, right? So. We're going to run through an exercise today listening to a Michael Jackson song that will start to illuminate what Mixer Brain is. And once you get a sense of turning on and off your Mixer Brain, it's your first step to curing that and moving beyond it. So when you move beyond Mixer Brain, you move into Feeling Brain. And that's where we need to live as a mixer. So that's something that I'm working on every mix that I do because it's easier said than done. But let us now jump into the exercise. I'm going to play down a song for you. Now, this song is a famous song. You've all heard it before. It's such an 
a well-mixed song. So we're just going to listen and enjoy. Here we go. All right, that's plenty. Okay, so listen, that this is Billie Jean. It's sold a bajillion records. We've all heard of this, this song. We've been on the dance floor. No one has ever thought about the mix once, okay? So now we're gonna listen to the song one more time, right? Now we all agreed we loved that. It was great. Everything was natural. But this time, I want us to all listen to the song with a different mindset. Because we were just in our feeling brain when we were listening to that. Now we're gonna go into mixer brain, okay? Now, mixer brain is a nightmare for people wanting to mix music, write music, whatever. Now, we're gonna put our mixer brain on and we're gonna think like, imagine, like imagine you're an A&R and if this song doesn't sell, your career's over. You're Michael Jackson and it's like, if the mix isn't right, no one's gonna buy the record. You're Michael's manager that's giving feedback and you're like, ah, oh, this has gotta be a hit. So then start listening this time through for everything that is like potentially wrong, okay? Just find things that are wrong with the mix, okay? And I'm gonna do the same thing. We all have some notepads. I already wrote some in my laptop. So we're gonna play down a little bit and, and then we'll talk about it. So now we're not, we're not feeling anymore. We're just listening. In fact, Tucker, come up here really fast. Just sit here. I want you right up on here, listening to it loud. I'm gonna play this down and put you on the spot. You don't have to say anything, but write everything that's wrong with this, okay? Just suspend disbelief. Obviously, the song is awesome. Right. Find some weird stuff about this mix, okay? okay. So they did nine, allegedly 91 mixes of that song, okay? 91. And they ended up going with mix number two, okay? So I wasn't there, but I can only imagine that, because if you listen to this down with headphones or whatever, and you're in mixer brain, there's some weirdness in it. We're gonna go through it, and then we're gonna also go through like why that weirdness actually works, and why the mix feels so good. But they did 90 something, mixes of that song. And I can only imagine having not been there that along the way, the first couple mixes were like the feeling mix, right? We're feeling our bodies and we're not thinking too much about it. And then, you know, the manager has some ideas, the a and has got some notes, the record label's a little bit concerned that it's maybe not gonna be a hit, this and that, oh, maybe the vocal's low or whatever. And oh, like, eventually you erode through mixer brain this amazing mix down to mix 91, which I wish, I wish we could hear it someday. But at some point, someone must have been like, and I've done this in my mixes, in my sessions, and been like, wait a second. Everybody go back and listen to mix number two or mix number three or mix number one. And, and then everybody all of a sudden was like, oh, we just like fucked the whole thing up. Oh no, okay. So this exercise is to illustrate the concept of mixer brain that is always getting in the way of making great music. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the notes that I came up with. Intro, damn, the drums are so bright. There's a weird harshness in the cymbals. Five seconds, 
Wow, the shaker is way too loud. It's like all alone and way louder than the rest of the, the entire song. Turn that way down. It's like tip typical notes. 12 seconds. What's this cha-cha thing that comes in so loud? It startles me. Maybe we drop that by like 4 dB. You know, like cha-cha-cha-cha, right? Yep. You felt it. 30 seconds. Michael Jackson's lead is way too low. Don't hit songs need the lead way up front. Like, listening to that song, the lead is so low. Wild. He's one of the best singers of all time. One minute and two seconds. The snap at this moment is way louder than the rest of the snaps. Can we turn it down a little bit to match the rest? One minute, 13 seconds. The panning on the horn part here is way on the right side. It's kind of awkward in my headphones. It's way out by itself. Maybe add some reverb. It seems kind of dry. Two minutes even. There's a really harsh S on the word plans. And then a few seconds later, dance and advice. Okay, final note. This is more of a production note. The song is like five minutes long. I'm not sure people have the attention span for this. All right, so these are examples of fake notes that I came up with under Mixer Brain. Did anybody have any good ones that like, felt weird that you want to share? Anybody write anything down? Who's brave? Who's brave? I wrote down that the S's were really strong. There you go. And that those could be tightened out. So every time that you ever danced to the song and dance floor, of which I know there have been many, did you ever think about those S's? No. Never once did you notice any semblance on this song. Never once did anybody, did anybody have anything else weird that they're noticing now that they... The tom hits, I said the tom hits and the snaps needed to be louder. That was there you, okay, idea. so there you go. It's like even the opposite of what I said, right? So, like, again, on the dance floor, you never had that instinct no. once, right? No. Because when you were dancing to the song or listening in your car or whatever, you weren't in mixer brain. No. You were in feeling brain, right? So that just illuminates the concept that when we're being engineers or writers or producers, we're using an entirely different part of our brain to come up with these things, right? Now, this is the flip side. So when you listen down for feeling, things take a much different um, approach. Here, come up here really fast. And I just want you to hear how much louder okay. the... Um, how much louder the shaker is than the rest of the song. Just really fast. Right when it comes in. It's like, I feel like it's like 5 dB louder than everything. And when the vocal comes in, it's like way louder than the vocal, right? So that's, if you're in Mixer Main, that's crazy, right? I'm gonna put the shaker louder than Michael Jackson's voice. That's wild. And then his vocal when it comes in is so low but the drums are so loud. Like, what's that about? Well, if you're going off of feeling and you know it's gonna be a dance song, right? What gets the body moving better than the second that shaker comes on? It's like, you cannot help but to start moving your exactly. body, right? Exactly. So that's the example of like, not a mixer brain decision. That's standing or sitting in front of a console, touching the fader, for the shaker and just moving it until your body is at the point where it starts moving, right? You're just letting go, you're bringing up the shaker because one thing you learn when you mix a lot of songs, percussion elements like shakers have the power to get your body moving in a certain pocket like better than anything. Like sometimes in a dance song, like a shaker is the nuclear option, right? Yeah. But you know, trying to get a shaker that loud past a nervous, artist or a nervous a &R, whatever who's not feeling but instead they're listening yeah. with mixer brain is tough right because it's two completely different mindsets thank you thank you for your help thank you. well done well done so that is an example of like well of course the shaker needs to be that loud right you almost you're now you're playing air shaker and your body's like air shaking right so when you're mixing without mixer brain you're constantly paying attention to what your body's doing Let's talk about the vocals being extremely low. Again, it's a dance song, right? So when you're mixing a song, you need to form a strategy. Like with this song, the strategy is to get people dancing, right? I would say that all of us have probably heard this song a hundred times, but could probably only remember just a couple of the lyrics, right? You know what I mean? There's some phrases in here that I Googled just even trying to figure out what they mean. And it never mattered before. The vocals tuck because this is a dance song, right? And the amount of like mixed courage to take a Michael Jackson song, maybe some people would say the greatest singer of all time, and it tuck him low in the mix yeah. so the drums can push the groove, that takes a lot of 
confidence. But that's how we would all mix the song if we're like, we're going to make a dance song and I want to dance to this, right? So that's the type of mindset you need to be in to make great mixes is feeling your body, turning off your brain, turning off mixer brain, and then you end up doing things based on what feels right as opposed to what I learned on YouTube or what's traditional for the genre. Because if you've been on the dance floor and a vocal comes in too hot, there's, then there's no, you can't have like loud in your face vocal and then loud in, in your face drums. It doesn't work like that. It's a trade off, right? There's only so much room. So by tucking the vocal, it makes the drums super loud and there's room for the drums to push the groove. Another one of the notes. So 47 seconds, the background vocals are way too loud. Turn them down to match lead. Okay, so we love to get a bit of Michael's personality in the song, right? Given that the vocals are tucked so much, there's a moment in the song where these background vocals come in left and right. The, the vocal's been mono and now all of a sudden it's loud, left and right. And those background vocals are much louder than the rest of the vocal. And that's a moment where we get a sense of Michael's personality and then also highlights a phrase, right? I think the phrase is, who would dance on the floor in the round? I have no idea what that means. Like re looked it up, like don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. That's our moment to get some Michael personality, right? So it's kind of in between beats where it can kind of like pop out there for a second. So it's like, oh, it's Michael. And then Michael's back down below and the drums come up and keep pushing the groove. So those are the kind of things when I'm mixing a song, I'm always looking out for. How can we stick to like the central core of my strategy for a song, but highlight personality through dynamics, bringing things quiet and loud. And that's what mixing is all about. So there should be elements that jump out at you. You know what I mean? It's not about balance, it's about imbalance. Sometimes it's about symmetry, but sometimes it's about asymmetry. How to know when it's about any of those things is you just feel your body, right? That's the cool thing about Mixer Brain is everybody before they got into music was like perfectly tuned to mix music, right? And the second you decide to become a mixer or songwriter or producer, you lose it, right? It goes away instantly. One thing that I like to do is to help me get out of mixer brain is I have my studio set up to where right here, this is a production, right? When I'm looking at my screen, this right here, this is a production, okay? And then this is music, right? If you're wondering why do I have speakers here and then this here, when I'm looking at a a session, you know, it almost turns off a part of my brain that is able to feel a song, you know? So I have it set up to where I can do my editing and certain things where it's really like efficient to have a computer, but then I can just quickly turn here, you know, and now I'm mixing and I'm not, yeah, there's a screen there, but we play movies here. There's no production stuff here. And I want to do an example of like, later on, we'll do this later on. I'm going to have someone sit here and kind of listen to a song that I have pulled up and look at all the like the plugins and stuff and see how your brain feels differently from when you're looking at the screen to now all of a sudden we turn over here and it, it unlocks a part of your brain and becomes a song all of a sudden. So one thing that I would recommend if you're watching this is set up your mixing workflow in such a way where you can get out of the computer for a certain part of your mix because that way you'll notice all of a sudden it's like you free up so many more system resources in your brain all of a sudden. I'm not a brain scientist, but you'll go from being just like some visual thing and all of a sudden, boom, you're in the song when you're not looking at it anymore. So that's one thing. When I got this console, it completely transformed the way that I did my mixing because it enabled me to get out of computer brain, get out of mixer brain and I can relate with the song in such a way where I'm working more off of feeling because I'm not seeing the production, I'm just hearing the song, it's wild. But Mixer Brain is not easy to get away from. It's a journey to cure it, but now that you know it exists, and that exists not just for music mixers, for songwriters, for managers, for anybody who is in music or trying to contribute to a music production will get infected with Mixer Brain instantly. And the journey to getting rid of it is to reconnect with the feeling in music and begin noticing slowly when your 
falling back into Mixer Brain. One, one really good exercise that I think everybody watching this should go through and everybody in here is take like five of your favorite songs that you knew of growing up. Songs that were like your favorite songs. You never thought about the mix once. Go back, put on your Mixer Brain and just write down everything that's messed up about this mix and you'll notice weird things that you've never noticed before under that mindset. And that starts to illuminate very clearly how it's such a huge level up when you can start putting down your mixing brain and getting into a feeling mindset. All right, stage one is over. Thank you. Phase one. Thank you, thank you. All right, so one thing that I do that's different than a lot of mixers is I don't want your stems, right? I want your DAW session if possible. Now, it's not always possible, but the type of music that I mix and as we go into the future, it, it's not some traditional thing where, oh, it's a rock song and there's a rhythm guitar and a lead guitar part and a vocal and where it's semi-formulaic where you can lay these things out and kind of like template your way through it. Or you can do a situation where someone produces a song and then it's time to mix and all of a sudden we're just gonna remove all their processing and start over again. That's just like a disastrous approach that makes zero sense in modern music because we make music completely differently than we used to in the past. So what I've found is that if people send me dry stems, well, there's no production anymore. So like, what are we doing? Like, how does that make sense? If people send me 100% wet stems, well, there's been such a terrible brain drain in music engineering to the point where usually that it leaves zero room for improvement unless the song is like samurai produced good, uh, which happens sometimes. It doesn't really leave much room to, you know, if let's say things were over compressed or over EQ'd, the dynamics have been ripped to shreds. It doesn't remove a lot of room for improvement. And on top of that, you'd be surprised to know that there's like an inverse relationship between big time successful producers and them actually knowing how to stem their productions out in a way that it sounds like their production. I know it's like no one ever like every assistant that I get like takes like they don't believe me when I say that like gear up because almost nothing that gets sent to us is going to be in a professional condition e even at the highest levels and it takes like two years for them to start to like wrap their head around like wow like even at the top of music it's kind of like a clusterfuck sometimes. So that being said, a lot of these producers that may not know how to stem out their stuff properly are absolutely incredible artists that make the best music. Like I, I've been so blessed to work on some amazing music. So we kind of devised a system where instead of relying on people to make stems and stuff, like let's figure out a way to where we can kind of get okay at every DAW, get almost every plugin and get to a point where Instead of someone wanting me to mix a song, to have to go through this process of trying to stem their thing out in such a way that's gonna work for me when they don't really maybe even know me or have any time, I just be like, just give me your DAW session, right? Now that's terrifying to, a lot of people listening to this would be just terrified by that concept because what does that mean? It means, well, you gotta be pretty good at Ableton, Logic, Pro Tools, Reason, Studio One, Band Lab, usually mixing songs. Some songs we're mixing off of web browser links now. This is what music is nowadays. Like, there's some massive songs that were made on iPhones, like Steve Lacey, you know, David. Like, this is common, okay? So if, if your instincts are to try to reject that and go back to the traditional thing of, send me your, your dry stems and I'm gonna mix it in Pro Tools or whatever, it's like, you're part of the past. It's like, not gonna work out well for you, I'm sorry. Or you just have to work in one specific genre in one area where you know, that's a little bit more traditional to work that way, but we like to stay flexible. So for several years now, I've just been collecting plugins and doing the DAW session route. And that enables me to pull up a song exactly where the, the producer left it off and protect all of their production aesthetic, which is like so important that you can, uh, you don't lose any, it, it's so common for an entire song's production to take a giant step backwards when it's sent to mixing and then no one stops and be like, hey, like, 
we have a cool sounding rough. It's like a good start. Why do these stems not sound like that? It's like in much worse condition. Now we're just gonna like, it's like remodeling a house, but just like bashing down the cool tile in the bathroom when the tile was sick, you know what I mean? It's like, no, let's remodel the house. Let's leave what's great, identify what can be improved, and that will be the path to remodeling a house in a much better way. So that's what we try to do with these DOS sessions. And having going through like 200 DOS sessions a year, I see a lot of trends with what people are doing. And generally everybody's doing way too much. And so much more of my mix, people are always like, what vocal chains do you use? Like what plugins are you this and that? Like more often than not these days, I am opening up people's DOS sessions, going through the stereo bus, going through the, the vocals and whatnot. And I'm 70 to 80% more removing than adding, right? This year has been just out of control the amount of like the, the things that we've seen, but like we will get vocal chains in Pro Tools, which is like every single track has a plugin on it or every, there may, in Pro Tools, what is there like eight, eight spots, thank you, eight spots on a track full of stuff. And then it's sent to an aux, like a subgroup for the, the leads or something, that's filled up. Then it'll go to like a group, like maybe an Ableton will go to a group and then that's filled up with stuff. And then there'll be like 15 DSers around like trying to clean up the disaster that's been made. And um, that's not to say every once in a while that a, like a reverent, terrible engineering approach makes something cool. And you gotta be prepared to let go and be like, this disaster of a vocal chain sounds cool, don't touch it. Because sometimes you try to clean it up and now it just loses something, right? Because a lot of times, a vocal will be made like that and it's kind of a catastrophe, but then the whole track is designed around the catastrophe and they kind of blend in this ultra catastrophe that sounds cool. So part about mixing is having the taste to know when that catastrophe of terrible production and engineering is actually really cool for some reason all of a sudden and just leaving it intact. I'm gonna kind of run through an example of something that I, I came up with this term like two days ago when I was preparing for this, but what was I calling it earlier? It was like a vocal, I already forgot. It was like a vocal ch chain spot. Yeah, a death spiral, yes. The vocal chain death spiral, cool. I'm gonna go on a death spiral right now, okay? So join me along my death spiral and there will be people watching this for sure that will be like, no one does that. No one, no one does, like, does it that badly. And then there'll be people watching this who are like, that's me, I need to stop, cut this out right now, okay? And I myself have gone on many uh, engineering mixing death spirals along the way, so it's nothing to be ashamed about. Doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but there is another way, okay? This is a song that I made with my friend Keon, uh, and I've been using it to show some examples. So I'm gonna go on a little vocal mixing death spiral really fast, and I'm gonna move to these speakers. So I'm gonna take a second to talk about my monitoring. These Kali Audios, um, I have a pair here, these are the ION8s, and those are the ION5s. I've been on these for about a year now. What's cool about these speakers is they are not in um, like a, a price range, like every, basically anybody who's serious about music can afford these speakers. They're not $6,000. I forget what these are. These are like kind of in the four to $800 range, something like that, I forget. You just go on like, whatever. We do great work on these speakers, we just mixed uh, a Doja Cat sing single on speakers that are, you know, not expensive. The premise why I like these Callies so much is they're a neutral reference, right? That means like, I don't like the concept of, oh, I have to learn my speakers, or oh, I have to learn the room. It's like, it should just be neutral, right? I should sit down and not think about any of that stuff. And um, I met this guy, Charles, through Cali Audio, who designed these speakers, and he did just such a great job of making these neutral. It's just, this is what this is, a neutral reference. I mix basically at one volume for almost the entire time. That one volume is with really flat speakers that don't try to make it sound good or bad. It's just a neutral reference. And then I know whatever I'm doing here is gonna translate really well to everything else. Like if you're sitting down and you have to, like while you're mixing, compensate for, I know in my room, it's a little bassy, so when I go to my car, it's like a little, it ends up having no bass. So I'm like always running this algorithm on my brain when I'm making songs that I need to like boost the, the bass in my head while I'm mixing. That's just like, that puts you back in like 
mixer brain and it's just too much for your brain to do at once. Like, before you sit down to do anything mix-wise, put a lot of effort into having your listening environment be a neutral reference. Another thing about these speakers are they're very detailed, but they're not so detailed that the, that it almost, what can happen if speakers get too detailed for mixing for me and my personal taste is all of a sudden the music sounds like a collection of sounds rather than a song, right? And it gets super distracting when it doesn't. So that's what I liked about back in the day with the NS10s. They were not super detailed at all, but it always sounded like music because there wasn't so much like extreme detail. I like both of them, the fives and the eights kind of sound the same exactly. Pretty much they're both designed to be neutral references. One of them will get louder, I guess. It's not always about having the clear, the lowest distortion, the clearest uh, speakers. It, it, it's about neutral reference, never having to compensate for any weird anomalies in your room. And it's not hard to get a room to be flat enough to where speaker correction can be the final touch. And then you never have to worry about translation. Like I don't have to use headphones to check my mixes anymore. I don't have to check mixes in my car. I'm literally just do the mix. It's incredible. Do the mix. I'm done. I don't have to listen to it anywhere. And that just comes from the confidence of like doing a bunch of them. And then I don't, I know it's flat. And every time I go into my car, it's perfect. You know what I mean? Let's get back to the death spiral. Okay. So I'm going to do a classic death spiral right now and follow along. It's going to be a fun death spiral. Hopefully I can pull this off right now. All right, let's listen to what we have here. It's a little like dark and muddy or whatever. I can't really hear it. So let's just like, let's do this classic thing where we just, you know, every tutorial that I've ever read about vocals is like, you got to make them brighter, right? Cut out the bass for sure, 100%, you know? Uh, read somewhere that 4.8 is like the magic thing for vocals. Let's listen to that. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, I can still barely hear it, so let's go with a, let's just make it louder, and compression is awesome, right? Rvox, so Rvox is a big death, death spiral uh, plugin for sure. Oh, great, it's starting to get there, right? But everybody agrees on the forms, right? You need at least two compressors on a vocal for it to be good, right? It's a rap music, so CLA 76, great plug-in, um, you know. I saw in a CLA tutorial that he was like pegging the meter, so that's gotta be good, right? So that's great, so now we're here. I don't really know what any of this shit does, so just maybe, you know. I mean, I actually do, but this is what, this is me death spiraling. So now we're... One of the great tricks that people do is 1176 into LA-2A, right? We know, we've heard about that, right? Classic, classic analog move, right? You've seen that before, so let's hit him with that. Along the way, I'm not even really listening to anything. I'm just death spiraling. That made it louder, so that's cool, right? It's starting to be really in your face. This is great, but it's start. It's like starting to get a little sibilant, right? Are you noticing the sibilance a little bit too much? So we got to DS it, right? Let's DS it. We're not going to go back to the fact that originally there was no sibilance. We're not going to even remember that. We're just, let's DS it. Because now, now that we've got it like in our face, which is always great, we need to start DSing, right? So let's see here. I'm just going to pull this DSer over here. Great DSer. The S's are gone, great. We're doing, we're getting some, I really think we're starting to get here somewhere with this vocal chain. There's a problem though, like. I'm hearing some weird resonance or like weird frequencies, right? You're hearing that for sure, Tucker. Yeah, Tucker, absolutely. So let's like freaking cut out some of these frequencies that are really disturbing us, right? So here, let's go, let's go. Watch me be slow. Pro, Q, three. Great EQ plugin. Oh my God. Will you look at that? 
we've got some problem frequencies. First of all, I don't know how this is still here because I cut all that out before, so let's just get rid of more of that. Now, this one looks particularly scary, right? So let's do that, that method of, what do they call this? Like spike and surgical sweep and plop. Let's do that, so. No, 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 we're gonna have that in this mix. Hell nah. There's some weird mid range thing going on. So let's just go like this so we can really hear what's wrong with this vocal. Found it. Bye bye. Now, we could keep going on this desk probably even further, right? Whatever this is, that, that's obviously peeking out too far according to this meter. What is this sibling here? I thought we did a DS, right? Should we hit it with some more? Maybe we uh, hit it with some of this dynamic, dynamic EQ. That's a new concept I started hearing about a few years ago. Let's hit it with some of that. That's probably why in the Michael Jackson song, those S's were a little, who said the S's were a little sharp? Yeah, they didn't have dynamic EQ back then. They didn't have it yet. That's what the kids are using these days. Yeah, so luckily we have that now. I mean, it's cutting a little highs. Let's add a little bit highs back in. That sounds great. But I noticed with all the, you know, like peeking some stuff out, we're starting to lose a little bit of the hype. You know what I mean? So, you know what the next step is? I think we got to saturate. How did you know? That's exactly what it is. That is what I don't it know is. how I guessed. You, so, black box, baby. Let's go. Let's saturate it right back. We took it out. Let's bring it back with some saturation. Let's go. All right, the death spiral. It's, we're spiraling. That did get better. Listen, hold on. A, A, B that really fast? Without? That's dead and lifeless. That's spot. Sure. Could use a little bit more tryout, obviously, but. Oh, that was a little, I almost say. High because vocal, right? Vocals are high. There is a problem. I'm hearing resonance. Did you notice that when we put in the exciter that the resonance really started to pop out? Let's pull up a resonance filter, which is a new term I've only been hearing for a year now, but thank gosh that we now have resonance filters. So let him, let's hit him with some classic. Hit him with a, a studio classic that all the pros use. Soothe too. You see all that right there? That was the things that were peeking out before, and now we're getting rid of them, right? Maybe this goes here. I think we got those resonance out. But I don't know, there's something. It's good, but it's just like, <clears throat> if we could just maybe hit it with a little bit of something to make it a little bit, maybe like more modern or whatever. Maggie Q. That's a good one. Should we, okay, cause that can add some air, right? Okay, let's do that. What is M A A G? They have that, that air button on it. Which one is it? The four? The six? Shouldn't without four? Um, oh, you know what? Boom, 40 kilohertz. Boom. That's that air it was missing. That was good. Air's back. Thank you, brother. Okay. Now, the one thing I was thinking is like, you know, if we could just like have one last plug in to really put it over the edge. It's the classic one. The, the greatest vocal plug, this isn't even me being sarcastic, this is legit. The greatest vocal plug-in of all time, which is Tucker. You're, I'm, I'm afraid of Tucker's what you're gonna say. Tucker's the plug-in. <laughs> I'm afraid. 
Born raised, probably down stars and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my login. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscious pockets fat. I'm talking. Well, this is but push, but I don't know. Does this seem a little spanky, maybe? Born raised, probably down stars and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my login. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscious. Yes, but there's no delay on this, so let's try quarter. I don't know. Born raised, probably down stars and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my login. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy. We're there. I think we're finally there. Okay, so. Born raised, probably down stars and want the wood. I'm gonna take a moment from being sarcastic. Vocal pocket, especially in rapping. Delay. When you're setting delay on rapping or singing or whatever, when there's a cadence that's required to fill into the pocket of a song, you don't want your delays trampling over the rapping, right? So when I put in that quarter note delay, I was just like, did it to make it sound bad or whatever, but why it's not working is now the kind of, like whatever that pocket that Keon is doing just gets trampled on by the delay, right? So let's just, I can't even go that far with it. Let's just take that off. Born raised, probably down sauce and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me. So this will kind of be in the condition where 90% of, um, well, and there's a, there'll always be like on the all the vocal thing too. They'll be like. Born raised, probably down sauce and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my login. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscious pockets fat. I'm talking action browsing. Uh, I need a shot. I might need insurance like a driver. Got too many bitches on my bum, but I'm a slut ain't got no moral compass. She want me to beat. I'm knife wonder. Talking commas with that. Wait, that was the wrong Fairchild. Anyway, we need a newer Fairchild. 670, right? Because it's stereo. We need some analog warmth. I feel like that's probably will deal with some of the harshness. This is kind of where very often at the highest level of music, I'll see chains like this. This is not me being like dramatic. Like, of course, there is something a little bit like cool about all the processing, right? It's not like the worst thing ever. But let me show you an example of what I'll end up doing in a mix, right? Just because it's like, you put 15 things on it, right? It, and you didn't need any of that. And you could see as we were spiraling downward, we were doing things and then doing other things to fix what we did before. And this is like, I'm so guilty of this. And the reason why I can like make fun of it now is because this is everybody's first five years of mixing. And if you just let that go and like, realize you don't got to do it that way. It's like you can do so much with so little. I'll get a vocal. I set this up a little bit. So this is um, a classic thing I'll, I'll, when I pre-mix. Now this might be an Ableton. This might be Logic. I'll see something like this, right? So. Born raised, probably down sauce and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell I'll be going through the artist's DAW session and be like, how can I improve the vocal, right? And I'll just start bypassing things, right? I can already identify a death spiral when I see it. And this is a very typical death spiral. A lot of times it'll actually be much worse than this. And a lot of times they're set up in such a way to where one ox is feeding another ox, which is feeding another, and just kind of like undeath spiraling it. There's a point when things are too far gone and you can't even undeath spiral because the whole song has like so many parts that they just unravel and explode and then it becomes like a mush pot situation. And then like, then you're spending like, you only get a, a certain amount of time per mix where you're objective, where you can make uh, good decisions without mixer brain when you're feeling it. And if you have to spend a day or two completely rebuilding all the vocal production, which honestly like an artist might spend like three weeks on their vocal production. The idea that for every song I can entirely rebuild that from scratch is just like, by the time I do that, I just already hate the song, you know what I mean? So if you get a little bit better as producers and songwriters uh, of not death spiraling so much, if you get your music mixed by someone else, you might find that it just sounds good now, so it doesn't need to be mixed by someone else. But if you do, then they will even be able to do a better mix because they're not dealing with like all these like mouth noises. You, it gets to the point where the sibilance and the breaths are louder than the actual rapping. That's so common. And 90% of what I mix when I get it is the breaths and the sibilance and all that stuff is just louder than the lyrics. And they're like, 
what's the secret to make to you made it so much better and i just went through and was like bypass 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 wow it was good already and there was like a magic thing so i'm just going to start here is a difference okay this is bad Forays, probably down sauce and wonder what i guess i'm kenny soft and famous bitches dm me too often now this is the same plugins where I just bypassed everything that wasn't this and then adjusted the volume. Forays, probably down sauce and wonder what I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell teams. Fucking hella that I love, I never call a Hennessy been clouding up my conscious pockets fat. I'm talking action Bronson. Uh, I need it. I need insurance like a driver. Got too many bitches on my bum, but I'm a slut and got no moral compass. She want me to. Like Florida, talking commas, put that on my mama. And then you're like, okay, well maybe I like a little bit of the brightness in the completely ultra fucked up one. So we'll go like what I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my log and hella that I love, I never call a Hennessy been clouding up my conscience. Fucking action bronson. Uh, what I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too. This sounds like a filtered mess of mouth noises and blah 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 blah, you know what I mean? And then this is like you're actually getting the nuance of the personality of the rapper and the performance. What I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my login. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscious pockets fat. I'm talking action Bronson. Uh, I need a shot. I might need insurance like a driver. Got too many bitches on my bum, but I'm a slut and got. So it goes from having 15 plugins where it just sounds like spittle and just like harsh and weird and processed. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been. Just pockets fed, I'm talking action Bronson. Uh, I need a shot. I might need insurance like a driver. And that's not to say that there isn't a song that it sounds cool when it's just mangled and bad. But there's another way. But what happens is rap is a little bit more forgiving with this. If you have a song where the, it's like a ballad and the singer is, I just didn't have like a good example where I could show the, um, like a singer or whatever uh, on YouTube, but like, when you have an emotional song, when a singer needs to be expressive and let the personality out, and it's just running into 50 different compressors, you notice the compression doesn't make it sound bigger. Compressors make things sound smaller. It's just every one of these plugins comes with a little gain added, so it keeps getting louder, so it's feeling bigger. But when you, when you like volume match the thing, like, like this is gonna sound like big like this, right? Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscience. It's big because it's loud, but if you just like, you know, now make this one louder. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscience. Pockets fat, I'm talking action Bronson. Uh, I need a shot. I might need insurance like a driver. There's, gotcha. there's so much more bo like bounce and expression in the voice. You're not getting sibilance that's louder than the vocal. And then like the rapper's actual craft of rapping shines through much more. Um, again, there's certain situations where the disaster aesthetic is great. Just be able to do both. So when you wanna be disaster aesthetic, you can do that. And then no, literally with two plugins, you can come up with a great vocal without all the shenanigans. Like you can see how, let's see if this will work out, but like, Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscious pockets fat. I'm talking action Bronson. Uh, I need a shot. I might need insurance like a driver. Got too many bitches on my bum, but I'm a slut and got. Literally, the vocal gets better as you're just removing stuff. You know what I mean? Let's just go through this one more time. Probably down sauce and want the wood. I guess I'm Kenny Loft and famous bitches DM me too often. Might sell TMZ my login. Tell her that I love her, never call her. Hennessy been clouding up my conscious pockets fat. I'm talking action Bronson. Uh, I need a shot. I might need insurance like a driver. Got so this is what ends up happening is when I'm going through these DAW sessions is that these improvements that I'm making is way less often because I'm adding something. Way more often I'm just removing things that didn't necessarily need to be there. However, I'm always trying to make sure that, you know, the art of cleaning things up is sometimes uncool, right? So you have to get to the point when your taste in music is such that you can kind of feel, there might be an emotion with the vocal being over-processed that just goes away when you clean it up. So you always have to be aware when you're doing this. Because there's been many times where I've gone through a mix, cleaned up all the vocals, and I got to the end, and I was just like, it's just not cool anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's more dynamic, it's more expressive. 
I can understand the artist more, but like suddenly it's just not cool, right? So then you go back to the beginning and try to do a mix with the vocal two processor. So that's why mixing is so hard because there isn't a right answer to any of this stuff. But if you, to tie it back to Mixer Brain, if you go through this using feeling and not Mixer Brain, you'll end up coming up with something where it's like, more often than not, you're maximizing the aesthetic of just chaos engineering, you know what I mean? Which is like de death spiral aesthetic, which is cool sometimes. And then like actually um, well engineered aesthetic as well. And you try to see which way has the most emotion. I feel in this particular song, just having the vocal less processed enables us to feel more passion in the voice of the rapper. But certain songs where that's not the case, you know? Um, there's genres of music where you can't even understand any of the words and it's super cool and you feel a thing and it's great. But anyway, so Death Spiral. We good on that? Is everybody good on the Death Spiral? We're gonna be more aware of Death Spiraling in the future. Studio 4, East West. This is a special room to me because I started as an intern for East West in 2009. Nowadays, I moved into this room about three years ago, and this is kind of a dream come true for me because I always wanted to like have my own mix room in a classic recording studio, and for that to happen and for it to be East West Studios is like the ultimate dream come true for me. Um, and if you just look up the history of this building, I, I mean, Everything from the Beach Boys to Sinatra to all these Rick Rubin um, rock albums and stuff like that. So it's just such a historical landmark. But anyway, so this is my Cali Audio 714 system. Sounds amazing. And I was so blessed to have met Cali, got me all sorted. And now I put this system up against anybody's system. It's calibrated so well. It's just a Mac Mini back here running everything. And because almost everything that we mix on Atmos, we also did on stereo first, you know, we're not using tons of plugins. It becomes more about um, panning and uh, spacing things out. So you'll notice this room is just filled up with memories that have kind of followed me from studio to studio. And I try to like cultivate a teenage bedroom aesthetic for this room. And then as you'll see in a bit, the other side is more kind of like adult business vibes, but this is called the lock of Y2K. This is a famous music producer. This is a lock of his hair. Um, this is Y2K's hair lock, and it has special magic properties, which I don't know if you can even see that, but maybe we'll zoom in on it later. But it says, the lock of Y2K, uncommon, plus 20 charisma, negative 15 intelligence, negative 15 strength, harvested on the 12th of March, 2021, at 1.50 p.m. What makes this even more crazy is that Doja Cat was the one who harvested this for me. So this has a lot of history. This is one of my prized possessions and happy bidding someday when I pass on this. It'll be worth a lot of money someday. Pez, Baby Yoda, Pez. Employee of the month. And you'll be happy to know we have two this month. Once we, we have Murphy and then Trevor. Snow Allegra, I've done a lot of mixing with Snow and one of the best honors ever was she gave me the second pressing of her vinyl when the album came out with this like nice little friendly message. This up here is the wall of fame. This was something I was doing back in the day, but I wanted to do like a New York delicatessen style feel to the studio. So those, those are just some friends. We have a good one. This is Jesse Rutherford of The Neighborhood. And some of this stuff is just like fake. Like this guy where it says only the rich, this guy. Don't actually know this guy. What's going on here? This is the Trevor's parking tickets that he acquired along the way up here on the wall do a little zoom in there yeah this is only like 1 15th of really the parking tickets that you've acquired along so the way many. mod son an incredible artist painted this painting for me and if anybody's ever painted something for you it's like the best gift ever um it just the feeling you get when someone like sat down and made a piece of art for you just to give it to you as a gift that's like the best so um, I love that. Over here is my signed John Wick poster, signed by John Wick. No one has that in their studio in the world, except for me, so I'm vibing. I took this from Bedrock. This is just space, the universe. So this is like the assistant rig. It's also the rig where we do all our DAW pre-mixing. So 
if I get an Ableton session or a Logic session or whatever, this computer has so many plugins it, and they're all kind of like up to date. It just functions really well. So this can open almost any DAW session. And what I'll do is when I get a mix, I'll sit down on this rig and I'll kind of go through it. And Trevor will be here, Trevor and Ivan, getting it all ready to where there's like, if we're missing plugins or whatever, we'll get that going. We'll decide, are we gonna mix this song in this DAW or are we gonna stem it out a way that we know how to do it to where it works best for me? And then we'll take it in the other room and mix it in Pro Tools where I have my console and everything. So this is just like a Pro Tools, what is the HDIO down here? And um, this is an iMac from God knows when. It's old and it's still slaying. So, and then these speakers, these are secrets. Um, don't look too closely at these. These are Kali Audios that aren't out yet. Spoiler alert, they're awesome. So I hope that you can get a pair someday. And we just got a little monitor controller, a little fader here, some headphones. And yeah, this is where we do all our pre-mixing. Okay, this is huge. Room spray. You know, like you get all the smell of a candle and it just lingers. You look, at, look at that. Maybe one of these is like 60 bucks and it lasts like almost an entire year, right? So we favor Bayes from Diptyque and this Aesop room spray in the studio. And that way, you know, candles make dust. Dust gets into your gear and people have to dust. Like if you're burning candles or incense all the time in a studio, yeah, it smells great and it's cool. But then you just get this layer of dust all over everything and it's a constant battle against dust. So when I came up on the concept of room spray, this was life changing to me and we're saving thousands of dollars on candles, I would say, like. So this is huge. I feel like I should get like a bunch of this for free, right? This is Candace Stewart, the studio manager of East West, and she's just been instrumental in my career. Yeah, so we just need a moment for Candace, the studio manager. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the other side of Studio 4. This is where we do the stereo mixing. Here we have this Avid S4 console. This allows me to get out of computer screen world and sit here and start mixing without looking at a computer screen. Like we have a screen up there for, for movies and stuff like that, but I don't really like look at the production. And this allows me to like automate everything out um, in a way that is very intuitive where I can fly between uh, the parts of a song really quickly, like jumping around from like the bass parts to the drums and whatever very quickly. And then I can build out the automation of a mix with my transport here in a way that's very intuitive and musical that I'm not getting when I'm just like hunched over a computer screen with a mouse like looking uh, at uh, Pro Tools or whatever DAW. Like when you take it out of the DAW, and I can really see why like a lot of the older mixers hung with their analog consoles for so long because that workflow of having everything out on faders puts your brain in such a musical uh, place and that workflow is just outstanding. I was like, people always debate against like the sonic characteristics of analog and digital, but I think like the biggest part of analog sound is the workflow. You end up having uh, so much more expressive mixes uh, when you're out of the computer and doing it this way. And it's one of those things that's like, I would have been like listening to this years ago back when, yeah, but I can just do it with a mouse and keyboard better than that it's fine like whatever it's not a big deal until you finally do it uh the other way the traditional way and then you're like oh, okay wow not only is this way more fun you end up doing so much more musical work and the results just end up being way better and uh i think this is honestly like this is a little expensive but in terms of gear purchases this is like the smartest move I ever made. I said for Cali Audio IN5s, IN8s. Love these Cali Audio speakers. Uh, and then we've got the big PMC mains up here. And we got a little keyboard here. So if I do need to do like a keyboard thing here, I can be like keyboard mouse warrior and switch over here. And now I'm here and, um, and yeah, then sometimes you can do like a dual situation like this if you need to, uh, which is like Yanni would do. If there are any Yanni fans watching this. Uh, yeah, they're like no, just way over all their heads. It's fine. This is my Grammy that just sits up here reminding me of uh, how good I am. At, no, just kidding. It's just it's just here because it looks cool. We have a little vocal chain in here in case like on the rare event that we're uh, recording vocals in here. I have a bunch of really cool Pokemon cards 
that are for a bunch of the albums that I've worked on, like Nikki, Channel Orange, 100 Gex, I think it's the blonde one, JPEG, Danny Brown, Doja Cat, and um, yeah, I just love, I love these things. Dog Crate from Murphy, the studio dog who is not in the room right now because he's a little chaotic. And in here, we just have, this is the interface that we're working off of. It's just an Avid system. It's all run off of a laptop. Crazy, right? Got a UAD box back in there, and this is uh, just a, a RAID array for storage. Yeah, we got a little record player back here. It's nice to have a good record player, because a lot of these albums that you mix um, do have a vinyl made, and it's nice to, it, it's funny the amount of times that an artist will have their vinyl made and they get sent to test pressing, and like no one has a record player to listen to it. So they end up going to like a record player store and put it down on the turntable and like listen to headphones and make sure there's not a problem with the vinyl. But after that happened so many times, I'm just gonna get a good record player. And now uh, we got that sorted. So this is my uh, Kenny Beats Don't Overthink Shit sign, which is a good reminder every once in a while to go look back at that and uh, try not to overthink shit. That is same, it's the same thing as like mixer, uh, mixer brain is not overthinking things, it's all kind of tied together. Throughout all the walls, there's a lot of these Instax photos, which we've just taken over the years. It's cool because there's just so many memories and a lot of this stuff goes back almost eight or nine years now. So these are just, you know, albums that I've worked on taking Instax photos. This building dates back to United Western Recorders, which is, I don't know, the 60s or something? I can never remember if it's the 50s, 60s, 70s, I don't know. I think that concludes the studio tour. Yeah, we've got everything. All right, MixCon, baby. It's a wrap. See you in a few years. We'll do it again. <laughs> All right, big thanks to Jeff Ellis for that amazing MixCon masterclass. Big thanks to the artist for letting us mess around with his vocal tracks. And big thanks to Cali Audio for helping make this one free to the public. Jeff loves their monitors and for good reason. They're some of the best bang for the buck monitors out there. But Jeff honestly prefers them over the prior monitors he had in that studio, which cost many times more than the Cali audio monitors he now has in there. They just get you great results regardless of what your price range is, especially in the three-way IN series. I've taken a close look at on this channel and I think are absolutely some of the best monitors ever made in that price range and really compete with monitors that cost much more. But if you're getting annoyed at me for talking about things that cost money, I've got free stuff for you too. Check out the MixCon Mega Giveaway. If you're checking out this presentation around the time it comes out, we are still giving away more than $10,000 worth of free gear. And you've got three chances to win. So check for the link in the description and down in the comments below. And good luck to you. Also know that we have a live Q&A coming up with Jeff right after this, where you can ask him your own questions in real time. And of course, if you're watching this in the future, that live Q&A as well as this masterclass will be available on replay. If you want to make sure you don't miss any more of the MixCon live premieres that are coming up, go over to mix-con.com. That's mix-con.com and RSVP there to be alerted when our next MixCon masterclasses and live Q&A sessions come out. All right. Big thanks for joining me for this masterclass, and I hope to see you in the live Q&A with Jeff Ellis coming up next.